Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hey there. Just, uh, just ride my skateboard. Got me a big parking lot with a sign that says no skateboarding. Perfect place. But actually, I'm just passing through because there's a place for skaters in the park across the street from my house. It's got some ramps and rails. Really good place to practice my kick turns and ollies and flip and shove it's. Still working on that fakey backside big spin, though. Okay, okay, I'm, 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 I'm not really. I, I can't even stand on a skateboard without falling off. I walk one of the English Bull Terriers over to the skate park in the warm months and watch the kids fall off their boards, which is fun. But they always get up and never stop practicing. And you know, some of them are pretty impressive. My main interest with skateboarding is the music that evolved along with it. In fact, there's a whole subgenre of alt-rock built on skateboarding culture. And there were plenty of legendary rock acts that found their first fans among the skate crowd. This music goes back a lot further than you might expect, too. So I think it's time we give skate punk a bit of a spin. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. From 1987 and an album called Join the Army, that's Suicidal Tendencies with Possessed to Skate. They wrote that one for a movie that was being made on skate culture in Southern California. It's a really bad movie, but it's a great song. Hello again, I'm Ellen Cross, and this time we're looking at another corner of the punk rock universe, the one that deals with skateboarding. Now, this might seem like a pretty narrow topic, but as you'll see, it's not. The effect of this music has been wide-ranging and highly influential for more than 40 years now. But if we're going to figure this all out, we have to start at the beginning, which in this case is the 1940s. We don't know who the first skateboarder was, but it was probably some California surfer who wanted the same kind of fun without getting wet or wanted to have fun when the waves just weren't there. The very earliest skateboards were nothing more than a plank of wood with some roller skate wheels bolted to the bottom. Not very safe, not well balanced, but you got to start somewhere. The first surfboard-like skateboards probably showed up in the late 40s or early 1950s. We do know that a surf shop in Los Angeles run by a guy named Bill Richard made a deal with the Chicago Roller Skate Company to produce a special set of wheels that could be attached to the bottom of a deck which at this point was usually just a slab of wood that was, you know, basically carved out. Skateboarding, or sidewalk surfing, caught on with some people in Southern California, usually surfers, who tried the same tricks on dry land as they did in the ocean. Designs got better, and by 1963, there were a number of shops specializing in these new, well, let's call them what they were, death traps. And they were death traps. Construction was very rudimentary, And we still had a long, long way to go with the design of the deck and especially the wheels and trucks. Thousands of people were hospitalized each year with skateboard injuries. Still, skateboards had their fans. A couple of magazines popped up, and by the middle 1960s, there were skateboarding competitions, again focused mainly in Southern California. A few skaters were good enough to get sponsors and toured the U.S. showing off their tricks. But by 1967, skateboards lost any cachet they had. They were branded as a fad, kind of like a hula hoop, if that means anything to you, and they really weren't much of a factor with anyone for probably another decade. The resurrection of skateboarding began in about 1975. No more steel roller skate wheels. The new wheels were made of polyurethane and offered much better traction, leading to many fewer wipeouts. Instead of being made just of wood, decks were now being offered in aluminum, fiberglass, and various composites. Competitions resumed, and the first purpose-built skate parks started showing up. One of the biggest years for skateboarding was 1976. California suffered from a terrible drought, causing a lot of swimming pools to remain dry. And a lot of those pools became bowls for skaters. These new surfaces lent themselves to new tricks, and freestyle skateboarding went to the next level. Okay, so where does the music come in? Well, in the beginning, surfers and skaters shared the same tunes because... Like I said, surfing and skating were so tightly related. For example. (music) 
But by the time we got to the late 1970s, skate culture had begun to bond with this new thing called punk rock. Made sense. Skating was about going fast, taking risks, and being aggressive. Skating was a way to work through anger and confusion. Skating was a way of sticking it to the establishment and the man. And skating was about sheer, raw adrenaline. And so was punk rock, especially California punk rock, which was the main predecessor to American hardcore punk. If there is a ground zero for skate punk, it's probably in Oxnard, California. And that's because in 1975, the city built a skate park. And it was a magnet for tons of kids. And they all skated to either metal or southern rock. But when punk came along, it was harder, faster, more reckless. That became their soundtrack. Some of these skaters formed their own bands that specialized in music just for the skate crowd. They had names like Aggression and Ill Repute. And the scene even had a name, Nardcore, after Oxnard. Here's an example of this. This is a Nardcore band called Dr. No, K-N-O-W. And the track is Mr. Freeze. If you're familiar with skate punk, you can hear the sound start to emerge with that song. They were looking for something that replicated the feel of skateboarding. They often connected through a magazine called Thrasher, which not only covered skating, but the bands associated with skateboarding, bringing the bands practicing this new breed of punk from not only Oxnard, but also Orange County and even San Francisco. The magazine's name is also related to the genre's original name, Skate Thrash. The term skate punk also seems to have been coined by an employee of Thrasher magazine. For example, skaters south of Los Angeles glommed onto bands like Black Flag. Their music was hard, fast, and intense. And songs like this work very well at the skate park. I won't apologize for acting out of line. You see the way I am. You leave any time you tag us. I'll pray. That's Black Flag from 1978 with Nervous Breakdown. Not actual skate punk, but definitely part of its ancestry. We can throw in bands like The Adolescents, also from Southern California, The Descendants, California again, Circle Jerks, more California, and The Dead Kennedys, Bay Area Hardcore. But there was also an English element to all this. The Buzzcocks from Manchester, The Exploited from Edinburgh, and Discharge, Northern England. We also need to look at Texas and an Austin band called Big Boys. They were formed in 1977 and eventually made their way toward hardcore, but with added elements of funk. All the members were skaters themselves, and the Chili Peppers ended up being big fans of Big Boys. In the beginning, they were hard, fast, and very punk. They appeared in skateboard magazines and even had their own custom Big Boys skateboard design. They appeared on a series of compilation records called Skate Rock, Basically, collections of hard, fast songs to play while working out your moves on the halfpipe. We should probably have a listen to some big boys. This is from 1980, and it harkens back to a song that we already talked about. Another band from the super early skate punk days was JFA, which stood for Jody Foster's Army. They were from Phoenix and were formed by three guys who met skateboarding. So many of their songs had skateboard themes. JFA appeared on just about every skateboard-related punk rock compilation in the 1980s. These records had titles like Blazing Wheels and Marking Trucks, Born to Skate, Concrete Waves, and Explicit Skate Rock. I know of at least a dozen soundtracks to skateboard films that feature JFA material. Tony Hawk knew all about JFA, which is why you'll find JFA music in his skateboard video games. And there are at least three custom JFA signature skateboards. Let's go back to 1981 for an EP called Blatant Localism. Six songs, and the whole thing is over in seven minutes and nine seconds. It's not long, but it was loaded with skateboarding references, including the cover artwork. In fact, this was probably the first obvious record of skateboard. Let's go back and talk compilations. Doug Moody 
formed a label called Mystic Records in the early 1980s. It was based out of California, of course, and was on a mission to release as many singles and albums and compilations as it could, featuring groups that would become synonymous with skateboard culture. Moody, an Englishman who started in the industry recording R&B and soul bands in the 50s and 60s, estimates that he recorded somewhere around 500 bands over about six years. He identified with these kids in their ratty clothes, their secondhand instruments and angsty attitudes. And so many of them would show up at his studio on skateboards. That was their method of transportation. And these compilations went a long way to helping the scene coalesce. Bands to pass through Mystic Records include No Effects, Black Flag, The Minutemen, Bad Religion, and here's these guys again, Suicidal Tendencies. The video for this song is filled with skateboard imagery. Still love that song. Coming up, more bands that helped establish skate punk and those who set the stage for the music that would follow. Hang on. We're going through the history of skate punk. As you heard, the early days of the genre were dominated by sharp, fast, angry songs containing the maximum amount of adrenaline. Very cathartic. But it also led to some problems, mainly violence. And in L.A., gang violence was a real big problem associated with the skate crowd for a while. And that made playing gigs difficult. Meanwhile, the music continued to mutate. By 1985, the original skate punk sound had acquired a new thing, elements of heavy metal, including <gasps> guitar solos. This actually fractured the community because many thought that things were getting too metal. Some bands who liked this approach moved away from skate punk and found home in various metal genres. But, of course, there were those who remained true to hardcore punk. Meanwhile, and here's where I think it gets interesting, some skate punk bands started to get more melodic. The music was still fast and intense, but there were actual singable melodies. The inflection point might have been Bad Religion's 1988 album, Suffer. Try to conjure up the skate punk sounds that we've heard to this point. Now listen to this. I think you'll hear the evolution. Turns out that what skate punk needed to grow were a few more pop sensibilities. And after that bad religion record, this is the direction in which most bands headed. Perfect timing, too, because at the dawn of the 90s, alt-rock was about to have its moment in the sun. Grunge led the way, but that was just the entry drug. Once people started getting a taste for alternative, it was game on for all kinds of acts for the next five years. Skate punk did have to wait for its turn for a mainstream breakthrough, but when it happened... It happened big. The first indications that something special was going on with skate punk came in 1993 when Pennywise, another SoCal band brought up on punk rock, released a record entitled Unknown Road. By indie standards, it sold a lot, about 100,000 copies, and it cemented them as a force in the skate punk world. Let's have a listen. Now we're starting to hear the modern skate punk sound. Here's another important record from the early 1990s. Punk in Drublick from L.A.'s No Effects. It would take a while, but this record would sell, believe it or not, more than 500,000 copies in the U.S. alone. Fat Mike and his band No Effects with Linoleum from the Punk in Drublick album in 1994. That song even got some airplay on alt-rock radio stations. But the biggest breakthrough in the world of skate punk came from a band that featured a brainiac kid and a school janitor. The roots of The Offspring go back to 1983 when Brian Holland and his buddy Greg Creasel started jamming in a garage in Orange County. Members came and went until the cool janitor at their school a guy that everybody called Noodles, decided to join up with these kids. Not only was he an experienced punk rock guitarist, but you know, as a practical matter, he was the only guy in the band old enough to buy beer. The original name of the group was Manic Subsidal, but that changed to The Offspring in 1986, 
after everyone saw a B-movie called The Offspring, They Were Born to Kill. There were demos, at least one 7-inch single, and a couple of spots on those oh-so-important compilation records of the day. The first Offspring album was self-titled and was released in 1989. That was followed by another indie record entitled Ignition in 1992. They landed tours with Pennywise and a few other like-minded skate punk bands. Plus, some of these songs started showing up in snowboarding videos. Didn't seem like a big deal at the time, but just wait. On April 8, 1994, the exact same day Kurt Cobain was found dead in a room above a greenhouse in his backyard, The Offspring quietly released an album called Smash. It was a complete indie thing and issued through Bad Religion's Epitaph label. Fluke timing is key to this story. Grunge, although still very big in 1994, seemed to be on the wane. The alt-rock kids were looking for something new. And although it would take a few more months for the effect of Kurt's death to sink in, a retrospective view from a couple of decades later shows that his death opened up a creative and spiritual vacuum in alt rock, and that vacuum needed to be filled with something. It just so happens that there was a building revival in the interest for old school punk rock, and by that I mean the punk before hardcore. Think of bands like the Ramones and the Clash and the Sex Pistols, music that was still hard and fast, but had a sing along quality to it. And think about Nirvana sound too hard, sometimes fast, always intense but never without a singable melody and a big chorus. When you get right down to it, Nirvana was adjacent to the skate punk sound. So, if you were into an album like Nevermind, it really wasn't a great leap over to The Offspring and Smash. A few songs showed up in those snowboarding videos I was talking about. That helped set the stage. And then one song in particular started getting mainstream radio airplay in Los Angeles. And then, boom. When Come On and Play became a hit, the whole album blew up. The Offspring became part of the mid-90s holy trinity of punk rock, along with Green Day, who were also admirably filling the Kurt Cobain vacuum, and Rancid, who sometimes sounded more Clash than The Clash. Smash sold and sold and sold. Today, it could be the biggest-selling indie record of all time, with global sales somewhere around 20 million copies. Not bad for a record that cost $20,000 to make. Skate punk was everywhere in mainstream rock in the middle 1990s. In a moment, we'll look at some of the bands who made that happen. Skate punk's glory years began in late 1994 and continued for a good 10 years. The Offspring continued to sell albums by the boatload, and this led to fans discovering bands like Goldfinger, Lagwagon, Face to Face, MXPX, and Unwritten Law. Then came the Warped Tour. Founder Kevin Lyman wanted a Lollapalooza-like traveling music festival that was heavily biased towards punk rock. That would change over the next 27 years, but punk, and a lot of skate punk, was at the heart of the Warped Tour. For year one, and this is 1995, it was just the Warped Tour. But from 1996 on, it became the Vans Warp Tour, Vans being the maker of skateboard shoes. And surprise, surprise, this helped cement and promote the relationship between this melodic punk rock and skateboard culture. I've never been able to get an accurate count on how many bands played the Warp Tour during its existence, 27 years, hundreds, hundreds for sure. And because it was all ages, the music reached an incredibly wide audience as it touched down in places throughout the U.S., Canada, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. One band that benefited greatly from the Warped Tour exposure was these guys, who appeared six different times. And that included a couple of years when they were selling millions and millions of records. There's Blink-182 and The Rock Show. By the new millennium, skate punk was massive. Not only were bands like Blink-182, The Offspring, MXPX, Pennywise, and NoFX doing well, so were newer bands. 
Sum 41, for example. And even pop music wasn't immune. Avril Lavigne had a massive worldwide hit with a song called Skater Boy in 2002. Skateboarding culture had grabbed mainstream interest like never before. Pro Border Tony Hawk's video games sold by the millions, and each one featured appropriate music from groups like The Vandals and Lagwagon, Suicidal Tendencies, Bill and Colin, Bad Religion, and so many more. Here's an interesting stat I ran across. In 2001, more people in the U.S. were into skateboarding, almost 11 million people, than playing baseball. Skateboarding became a respectable form of physical activity in education circles. There's now a Skateboarding Hall of Fame. And there was even a skateboarding event in conjunction with the prestigious John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. And as of 2020, skateboarding is an Olympic sport. And more cities and towns built skateboard parks. In China, there's a 12,000-square-foot park complete with a 5,000-seat stadium just for skateboarding. Oh, and speaking of skateboarding's growing global reach, it's blown up in Africa and South America. Many of the boards used there are designed to be ridden barefoot. Meanwhile, the music keeps coming. In the early 2010s, there was another spike in popularity of skateboarding, and that resulted in a new crop of bands, all inspired by older skate punk groups. And my absolute favorite from this generation is Fiddler, a band from L.A., who took what The Offspring and Blink-182 were doing and gave it their own twist. This is called Alcohol. One of the things I love about punk rock is that it's very, very malleable. It can take on so many forms in order to serve multiple purposes for different people around the planet. And you never know what the jumping off point might be for a new subgenre of punk. I mean, this whole thing that we've been talking about was launched by a piece of wood with some wheels on the bottom. Seriously? Yeah, here we are. If you like origin stories like this, there are plenty more available as Ongoing History of New Music podcasts. You can browse through hundreds of shows and all of them are available on all the platforms. Just download and go. You're invited to check out the daily updates at my website, a journal of musical things.com. There's the free daily newsletter that goes with it. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, and email can go to alan at alancross.ca. Technical productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross, and we'll talk to you next time. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.